Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Behind the Curtain. My name is Carly and I'm going to be the moderator for today. If you're watching with us live, welcome, and we encourage you to participate by sending any questions and comments you have into our live chat below. If you're watching with us after hours, then we encourage you to participate by sending us any comments to our YouTube channel, or you can email any feedback to info at majestictheater.com. And if programming like this is something that you value, then please consider sending a donation at majestictheater.com. But without further ado, I would love to introduce the cast of James and the Giant Peach. Oh, there we go. Hey now, hello, hello. 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 Hi. Hello. There's everybody. Is this everybody? Let's see. There we go. Now I can see everybody. Hey now and welcome to another Behind the Curtain for Majestic Children's Theater. Today we're talking about 20... 18s, James and the Giant Peach. I'm here with the cast. I'm here with most of the cast. Uh, we're missing James himself, and we're missing uh, uh, that's Ani Rude, and we're missing um, Mimi, uh, who played on Spiker, and a few other little characters. Uh, so, hello to them out there. Sorry you couldn't be with us. Thanks you guys for joining us. If you're listening at home, thanks for tuning in. If you're listening to this live, or if you're listening it to it on a rerun, thanks for listening. Um, yeah, uh, we usually guys, what I do is just throw this right out to you guys and, um, uh, to start a conversation and, uh, well, first let's go around, say your name, who you played in the show, um, and, uh, briefly what you're up to now. Um, yeah. And I'll do it as I see it here on my screen, which starts with Emily. Emily and I played Miss Spider, um, and other mini parts, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and I'm a rising sophomore in um, at Roosevelt University. Majoring in? Oh, majoring in musical theater. I forgot that part. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to hear that. Uh, Benjamin. Uh, hello, I'm Ben. I played the green grasshopper and a few other small parts. And um, I am going to be studying literature, uh, uh, library science at the University of Maine coming up. Nice. Nice. Uh, Joshua. Hi, uh, I'm Joshua. I played um, <clears throat> the centipede, uh, and I believe I also played a reporter as well for uh, the scene where you know, the, the aunts show off the big peach. Um, Right now, I am a rising sophomore at Dean College, going in for musical theater, and uh, yeah, happy to be here. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Giuseppe. Uh, I'm Giuseppe. I'm an upcoming junior at UMass Amherst. I played Earthworm, and uh, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> what are you studying? Uh, biochemistry. Biochemistry. Man, oh, man. My head hurts just thinking of that. <laughs> Maddie. Hi, I'm Maddie. I played Aunt Sponge as well as Number One, I think was my sailor name. And then just a random child at the end. I'm currently a rising sophomore at the University of Rhode Island where I study pharmacy. Sounds great. Thanks, Maddie. And Autumn. I'm Autumn. Um, I played Ladybird, and I played James's mom, and then I also played like a townsperson for like two seconds. Um, I'm gonna be a freshman at UMass Amherst for theater. Good for you. Good for you. Great. So, guys, I mean, as you know, or uh, you know, this is unscripted. This is just I just throw it out to you guys. So let's have a conversation. Talk about things you like, things you don't like about the show. I don't care. Be anything. Um, Good memories you have, or um, rehearsing or performing, funny things people in the audience said, or how kids reacted. Um, we can talk about the story itself. We can talk about any of the production elements, the music, how it looks, anything like that. Um, so I will throw it out to you guys. You can ask me a question. You can ask each other a question. Um, go ahead. Go for it. Anything at all. Yeah, Josh. I have a question for you, Steve. Um, 
So in the show, uh, when we're floating on the peach, it's a giant rug with a stem sticking out of it. What gave you that idea? I was always, I always wondered that. I don't think I asked. Oh, I don't know. So when back in 2010, when I was just stage managing the children's shows, and there was a different director at the time, we had done the same script of James and the Giant Peach, and um, you know, no will towards that show, but it's just it wasn't how I would have put it together. And I guess I just, uh, as I often do, if I'm stage managing something or if I'm acting in something, if, if I'm not directing, I usually just during the process will think about what would I do? What would I do if I were directing? And um, I drew up a design right then and there of, um, I mean, how do you do that peach, right? I mean, you read that script and it's like, how do you do the beach? And they're coming out of the peach and they're on top of it. Uh, they're supposed to be in the ocean. Yeah, it'd be nice if it were rounded, I guess. But then how do you even do that? And how do you play on it? Um, but I think I just thought a carpet would work and be kind of funny and quirky. And it reminded me of like, a, uh, I used to clean schools years and years ago. Okay. At night, no one was there. And I would, uh, so it reminded me of like a first grade or a kindergarten, second grade uh, classroom. They often have colorful rugs that the kids all, you know, gather on the rug and read a story so it looked kind of warm and inviting so just the way to do the peach I guess uh Josh um yeah I thought it'd be cute if you were the little stem um and and speaking and I even drew up like how okay how did you do the seagulls and they'd be balloons so that was fun anybody that watched uh yeah but I drew the balloons and the idea of the balloons and the seagulls way back in 2010, so long before the movie Up, so I did not rip off Up. <laughs> I did not. I came with that off of my own. <laughs> so yeah, so that's that, uh, Josh. Anybody else? Anything at all? Yeah, Emily. I have another um, production question yeah. for you. Um, so in previous productions, or I should say future as well, you've used puppets to represent animals and bugs like in charlotte's web you used a spider puppet for the main character and i was wondering why you chose to use actual actors except for the earthworm as um the characters instead of using puppets yeah that's funny you say that because i remember after jungle book saying kind of saying to myself um like i've had it with people dressing up um like animals you know it's enough already um it's just hard to do I feel kind of bad because you have to, you know, contort your body in all sorts of ways or hop around like a monkey. I don't know. You guys are usually pretty willing to do things like that. But I know I, I did children's theater when I was younger. And there are days when you go, oh, God, what am I doing? But, yeah, it's just hard to portray an animal. It's a challenge for the costume designer. Yeah. Uh, always. Um, and I just, it's hard to do. And even when it's done really well, um, it, it, it can be, it can still come across as weird. Um, there was a, there was a kid's show like in the 80s that I can kind of barely remember. It was called Zubuli Zoo. And I mean, you look back on it and it, it's a nightmare. That show looks like a nightmare. It's they dressed up like animals and they look really good, makeup and everything. Um, <laughs> but it just looks scary. Um, so yeah, I try to say if it's got animals, let's do a puppet. I just prefer puppets. I like puppets uh, rather than, you know, in Charlotte's Web, I like the pig puppet. Uh, rather than, you know, a kid dressing up like a pig and snorting and acting like a pig. Um, they're just more appealing to me, and I think for kids. Um, but even in this case, look at this picture. The earthworm was a puppet because I'm willing to stretch my imagination only so far. How do you do it? How is an earthworm going to walk around, and how do you costume an earthworm? Yeah. You know, break. it seemed obvious to me that that needed to be a puppet. Um, and he's cute. Look at him with his little glasses. <laughs> remember when your glasses fell off on stage and my dad my dad picked them up and then he gave them back to you because I remember it was like at the beginning of act two when we were like coming down the stairs and we were all we had to like crouch down like below stage yeah. and his glasses came off and they like <laughs> fell down and like my dad picked them up or he found them he gave them to you right like what, yeah. what? <laughs> that was funny that's too funny honestly because it was so dark I could never see and sometimes I would trip over the worm like mm. when we were going down the stairs and then uh it just happened. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you guys do really well with all the physicality of being. I, I buy it. And I think it was several years since that we had done 
animals and um, in this case they're insects, which is weird and different. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think I was willing to say, yeah, let's, I, I'm willing to stretch my imagination and given the right outfit and the right um, physicality from you guys that I would buy it. I'd buy it as animals. Um, and what, you know, I'd looked at, I looked at other productions that use puppets for each and every bug. At a certain point, it's like, you know, it's five people or six people crouched, you know, wearing black or something not interesting, crouched over, holding these puppets and manipulating these puppets. And I don't know, you know, it didn't, that didn't seem appealing to me. You guys would just be hunched over operating puppets rather than just seeing, seeing you as you are. It's a bit like, um, New Q. in the, oh, go ahead, Ben. <laughs> oh, sorry. My bad. Yeah. Um, I, it's a bit like in the um, in the Lion King, where if you could imagine everyone as a lion or as a whatever creature they're playing, eventually it would become a bit bland when it's sort of the main characters and the main focus of it, when everyone's moving around, presumably like they're anthropomorphic. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the costumes do well to to and, and combined with your physicality to suggest that they're. That they're bugs. I'd buy it. I, I actually did want to say, um, I think the costumes really help. Uh, you know, obviously, my because the worm, you know, besides wearing all pink and like doing this and scrunch, but like you know, um, Autumn's whole like outfit when she had her arms on her hips would like flush out, like kind of go around like a ladybug. I yeah. was obviously dressed up in the like I had boots all along my suspenders, and so you know when I sat like this, they'd all hang out. So I kind of gave that. Um, and Ben, I know for a while, sat with like his hands in his pockets. And so he had like that grasshopper, like arm stands where they kind of like, you know, like little claws because he had them sitting in his pockets whenever he was idle and whatnot. Um, and then Emily as the spider, you know, she had all of this going on. And so, you know, whenever she would like anime or something with her arms, you'd see like it all kind of spread out and it gives that effect of like webs or like the feet and whatnot. Um, yeah. The costumes did really, did a lot to help with that. Yeah, it was suggestive enough where, um, you know, I, I bought it, you know, I, I was, you know, I liked it. I like, I liked how you guys look and yeah, again, just, you know, we, I think we always talk, we, we all talked about what's, what's everyone's kind of default yeah. position and how do you stand and what makes you look wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Anybody else on um, that topic or uh, any other production element at all? Talk about Sponge and Spiker. Go ahead, Maddie. Um, this is, so the moment right after James, uh, when he does his opening and his parents are killed by the rhino rhinoceros, when the curtain first opens and just the silhouette of the house and the tree was so cool that I, cause I never saw it cause I was always yeah. obviously behind the stage and seeing it for the first time, it was just so ominous and it set the tone. I think, I think it kind of scared the kids at first cause it was so ominous, but then you had Mimi and I come out and, you know, we're comically evil it's not a scary kind of evil it's more of a laughable kind of evil and i thought it was just a really great comparison there and juxtaposition of those yeah yeah you and me be are fantastic as as sponge and spiker i mean that was a fun role that was, yeah. you know my makeup got crazier for sponge every night <laughs> i really it started out with just the mole and then the blue eyeshadow came and it just went downhill from there we talked about not mimi uh, on Spiker, but the character Mimi from the Drew Carey show. I don't know if you guys ever saw that, but she wore like a ton of makeup. I think that's what I do. Uh, Elizabeth, where are you when making you up? Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I like I like that moment a lot too, Maddie. I like the I like the touches of I like you holding that box of the pink donut box. I got free like Hostess cupcakes every show. I could not have been happier. <laughs> <laughs> there was that one show I choked on the cupcake though. And then when there was no more cupcakes. We had to go to donuts. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah, I remember saying, um, "Yeah, it'd be great if you were kind of always eating." Mm -hmm. uh, this is a kid show, which so was fine by me. <laughs> yeah, just gluttonous, you know. And um, mm -hmm. and and I remember talking to uh, the costume designer about just and and Josiah when talking about the set that they're that they're trash, you know, they're just mm -hmm. completely trash. Yeah, there's the two of them. That's nice. And um. Yeah, and the fact I think I had you kind of hunch over so you were yeah. short and tubby, and then I told Mimi stand up as straight as possible, and mm -hmm. I get 
the highest heel we can get on her. Um, she's tall as it is, but uh, it was just great. Mm -hmm. You guys really do look like a picture book of Aunt Sponge mm -hmm. and Spiker. Um, that's a blast. And yeah, and um, at that moment when the curtain opens, I remember Maddie that I was like, oh, I'd love to, I got to find a violin sample that sounds like mm -hmm. this moment in, um, in Beetlejuice, in the movie Beetlejuice. It's like, I got to find it. And then I was like, I'm just going to take it from the movie. So that, <laughs> so that little violin uh, sound effect when the curtain opens and we see on Sponge and on, on Spiker's house for the first time is, is taken right from that the music. It kind of reminded me of Sleepy Hollow a little yeah. bit. Like, yeah. that's, I actually wrote a note down where I wrote Sleepy Hollow music with a bunch of question marks because I didn't know if we took that from Sleepy Hollow or not. No, it's not. If that's and but I but I would I bet a thousand dollars that Danny Elfman was inspired by that that Sleepy Hollow song mm -hmm. uh, for Beetlejuice um, and some of his other works. That creepy violin uh, sound. My uh, when my sister took her kids, I think at that moment. You know, we grew up with that movie so well that she knew it was from there and she leans over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I like the dog barking in the background and mm -hmm. the crow. It just sounds uninviting and, you know, the dead, there's kind of like dead grass around the house. Everything looks dead. And and uh, whoever did the lighting, I mean, we remember saying that uh, make it look kind of black and white. And then when mm -hmm. that starts arriving, then we start to see color. So the old Wizard of Oz trick you know yeah. he's in a glum and gloomy world make it uh black and white and mm -hmm. dead thing. and then when things start going well and the adventure starts make it look uh, colorful you know that's exactly what uh that's what wizard of oz did and tons of kids entertainment has uh has borrowed that if they even invented it i don't know yeah someone someone else is gonna say something um yeah. so for my monologue uh, as the old, the creepy old man. Yeah. Where was that music from? Because it was very theatrical towards the the ending of it. You know, the climax. Well, the script is is funny. The book is funny because it has a lot of these the, these poems and what are like lyrics, but they don't give you any music to use. And they say you can find it on your own or you can not use music. But it seemed obvious to me that we needed to fill up this play with music uh, to make it work. And I was thinking about this, guys. I read this at like nine or 10 years old. And I would read it, you know, like a chapter at night. And I used to put on, uh, growing up, like in grocery stores, they used to have like cassette tapes of classical music with, <laughs> with like the sounds of nature underneath it. <laughs> it's, you know, things like that. So I would listen to the classical music while while reading James and the Giant Peach. I think I did that with a lot of books. But, um, I didn't use any of those songs. I can't remember what they were. But I just remembered that going into this, that, yeah, I used to listen to uh, uh, classical music. And uh, classical music is a great resource. There's tons of it, obviously. You can, it, it, you can use it for any mood that you're looking for. You'll find something. And I mean, the internet and YouTube at this point, you know, you could, even if you don't know what song you're looking for, if you know it needs to sound ominous or it needs to sound joyful or whatever, just type in those adjectives and type in classical music and browse and peruse and you'll find it. And then, you know, the internet's so awesome that then you, it gets a sense of what you're looking for and then it starts to recommend things to you. So some songs I've used were recommended uh, to me. So, but that's that song is Swan Lake, something like that. I don't know. I don't yeah. know if it it that well, but um, that's a familiar theme. And, um, that became kind of the Peaches theme. Um, and there's many others. Yeah, the music is a lot of fun. Yeah, Carly. Uh, I think I'm lagging out a little bit here. Are you guys able to hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. great. All right, well, Anne Marie is here with us again today. Anne Marie. And on the topic Hello. of music. Yeah. She wants to know if any of the cast was able to recognize the music during the Miss Spider catching the seagulls in her web scene. She laughed because she recognized it as the Acme Factory music from Looney Tunes. <laughs> yeah, do you guys know that? Did anyone else catch that? The um, during which scene? Spider is, has the spinning wheel and she's spinning the thread and he's like saying, tie it off, cut it. 
Oh. You guys for that music? I kind of not really. Dun, dun, from dun. I know it's from Looney Tunes, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a classical piece in itself. But yeah, speaking of using classical music, uh, yeah, Looney Tunes did that beautifully. Um, yeah. yeah, that's kind of the that's kind of the yeah Acme production production line song. You know, any kind of um, assembly line factory work going on, uh, you use that song. And um, oh, is it James Horner? I'm trying to think of the guy who does movie music um and he and he sampled that in honey i shrunk the kids the very first one and i think he was sued um because it's not, he used it without permission i think that song is not old enough to be in public domain and that's the other great thing about classical music is that it's all public domain right um, oh, it's so, that, so you can just use it you know without without worrying about anything um anyway yeah yeah Steve. Yeah, I thought you, Anne Marie, with the acne. <laughs> acne. Yeah. Go ahead, Ben. Um, uh, my my major question would be: What um, was there anything different adapting someone else's script rather than having it be one of your originals? Was there any different approach that you had to it? Well, whenever I adapt it myself, it's really hard to do but once it's done they're usually the easiest to stage because i know the parameters of the majestic i know the limitations i know the stage that i'm dealing with so i generally write with that in mind whereas <clears throat> you know this guy did not um but you know you just gotta do what you can with the script and and if you have to cut, cut things here or there or rearrange things to make it work for your stage you do what you got to do, and I think we definitely, we definitely did that uh, in this case. Um, but it's always nice to. It's great to. I wouldn't want to write all three all the time, or you know, that wouldn't be interesting. It's fun to take someone else's work um, and adapt it, you know, because uh, there are things there that I wouldn't have thought of clearly, you know. For what what would be an example of of one that you wouldn't have thought of? Oh, I mean, just anything, the way a joke that's said or, you know, the way someone says something or just the way something is written. Um, yeah, I would never think to, I'm sure this is in the book, but like the the part, the, um, the boat captain, that's you, and number one, number two, coming and looking through the, the telescope and, um, and the bugs behind you guys, waving hello. Um, I bought that. I would never have thought to, you know, to do something like that. Anybody else on anything at all? Josh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask, does anyone have any, uh, like, fun stories or maybe some moments that may have gone a little wrong? Any that we want to talk about? Go ahead, Autumn. <laughs> <laughs> one time. <laughs> So there's this one this one show in the very beginning. So when me and Giuseppe come out as James's parents and everything and we're fine and we're talking to James and then we and then we go off the other way. But there was one show when I was going and I wasn't even wearing any shoes because you know we are like at the beach so you know we were, we're going barefoot and I went to go up the stairs but I tripped and fell on the step. But it was before I was off stage so people saw and he just kept on walking. <laughs> <laughs> he was literally holding my hand, but he didn't even try to help me up or anything. He just kind of looked down and he like laughed and then he just kept going. And I was just on the stairs and I was like, oh my God. I was on, I was on stage. Um, People could see it happen. It was so, it was so bad. What a good husband, Giuseppe. My God. Yeah, what the heck? <laughs> that, that's the kind of role model you want to you wanna show to a child. It was, <laughs> I don't, yeah. Someone else. <laughs> go ahead. I was gonna say one of my favorite moments. I actually didn't make it into the show because it it never went right. Um, we had gotten these inflatable sharks. Oh, with, um, oh. Like, a remote I forgot control. about those. And um, we were determined to make them work out. And I remember like <laughs> the whole afternoon we were trying to make them go yeah. back and forth across the um, the back of the stage, and they just they wouldn't go. And oh. finally. We had to change the blocking and just cut the sharks because it was just so tragic. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of that, Emily, um, yeah, because when I had the idea for the seagulls to be balloons, 
thought, well, you got to use balloons elsewhere. You can't just have balloons once. It's got to be part of your theme or whatever. So I had two other thoughts for using balloons that both had to be cut because of time and just logistics. And they just, they weren't agreeing with us. And that is uh, the sharks, as you mentioned, I found, uh, you know, again, the internet's just awesome. Uh, it was probably recommended to me. Like I did, I, I bought so many weird fun toys for the years as props for children's theater. And it was these remote control uh, sharks that you put helium in. And uh, I thought that would be awesome. You know, they'd fly around the theater. But uh, the reality is that the range on the remote control isn't very um, far at all. So Ian would just lose control of it. And it's filled with helium. So it would float up to the ceiling or the, the, the uh, air conditioning would kick on and it would, you know, go haywire. And then the audience just laughs and... You know, you want to put your head in a hole in the wall, and um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's one that just blew up to the ceiling, and it was like you couldn't even do the scene because all the kids are just laughing and pointing at the shark on the ceiling. So I said, forget that, cut that. I also wanted to. I got a really large peach balloon. We had a helium tank backstage. We rented one for the seagulls, and uh, I wanted when when Ani is talking about you know floating uh, the peach rising and floating i wanted him to have a balloon um that looked like the peach but i couldn't make a i wanted there to be a stem and a leaf like you know like the carpet has here but i weighed the balloon down and um so yeah so that didn't work uh <laughs> but oh well it's so hard <laughs> again, to i had all this balloon ideas before before up came out i swear and uh, i remember <laughs> the, uh, the newspaper guy calling up and for some reason, for to promote the shows, the children's theater shows in the newspaper. And for some reason, you have to talk to him at like 10 o'clock at night. And uh, I remember him asking us about, you know, asking me about James and the Giant Peach. And I was like, well, I'm going to do, you know, I have some ideas. You know, the show isn't even up yet, you know. I'm like, on uh, balloons, can use a lot of balloons. Uh, it's going to be neat. I couldn't really articulate it well. And the guy was like, so you want me to write that? The balloons in the show i was like let's talk about through the looking glass because i got plenty to say oh, <laughs> <laughs> forget it <laughs> well what are you gonna do you know my... yeah go ahead ben uh my favorite one was probably i don't know maybe five shows in and when i was changing into the captain's outfit i either got the pants upside down or inside out of the wrong shoes so we had to take the completely the whole thing off and put it on again and by the time we had it all on the, it was one minute into our queue and I rushed on and I forgot to take the green grasshopper's ascot off so I tore that off and threw it into the wings and I, we just carried on with the scene like nothing had happened, even though they had been sitting there for about 60 seconds. Oh, man. Uh, go ahead, Maddie. There was another. The captain changed. That one always was almost right. Um, but one time we forgot the telescope. Oh, and, oh, yeah. <laughs> and there's many, many lines about the telescope. So I'm pretty sure... Ben just pretended to have one and like put his hands up like this. <laughs> and it's clear there was no telescope. <laughs> and then also, I believe this was the summer where you were dog sitting. Oh, geez. So we had the dog around at rehearsal. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, my parents. Uh, my parents' dog. They always go away. Um, for they always go away for a week. Right when I start rehearsing, I take care of the dog, and it's easier just to bring it in. It's this little white Bichon dog. And Haley, but I call it Sheepy or the Sheep. <laughs> yeah, she would. We'd be rehearsing, and she just walks across the stage. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Anybody else on um, bloopers or anything regarding the show? Go ahead, John. I, think... uh, I remember there was one show where I just got like, I got, I was in so much pain, like down in my abdomen and it started as soon as I got on stage and I just came backstage and I crashed onto the stairs because I had like a whole I had like a couple scenes before I went out again just that because they were like you alright bud I'm like <laughs> it was so bad but it was so funny because I got off 
and he's like, hey, nice, someone, someone was like, hey, good job, and then I just, like, hit the stairs, I was like, oh, my God. Hard to perform when you, when you don't feel well, yeah, it's, yeah. it stinks. Yeah. Go ahead, Autumn. I no, I was just gonna make a comment about because remember the scene where we had to eat the cotton candy, and it was really hard because I had these I had these really tight. So our costume designer gave us gave me these gloves that didn't fit me, and I suggested to wear this other pair, this red pair, but she wouldn't let me wear them, <laughs> she let me wear them for reasons, and. I was like, okay, fine, I'll wear these, but they took me like a minute to get on each, so they ended up getting really like gross and sticky because I didn't have time to take them off when we each like grabbed cotton candy, and so Ooh. they're really bad, and I had to like rip them off my hands because they just, and so I just had to stop wearing them because it just, it just never worked. I really wanted, the, the red gloves, they were so nice, they were like long, and they fit me, but I couldn't wear them. <laughs> so. That cotton candy scene was something else, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Dancing around while also having to eat cotton candy was actually a lot harder than it seemed. Yeah. yeah. Just a little bit. It was fun, though. It was fun. Yeah, it was fun. I think it's cute. I think it's nice to actually see you guys eat it. Um, I don't know. Did I need to do that? I don't know. Maybe not. But uh, It really I, added to the effect, though. Yeah, I thought it would be fun instead of... You could have had just chunks of foam and pretended to eat it. Nah. I, I, like, I like the real stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just after... And after you eat it, you're done. You don't have to deal with it. But uh, yeah, it was kind of funny coming in in the morning, and um, and Rebecca would be, you know, blowing up balloons. She'd come in, and she'd just be at the machine, just like going away every morning. <laughs> candy machine, making cotton candy at, at 9 a.m. Yeah. Rebecca was the queen of multitasking during her. this show. She's so good. Anything else, anybody? Anything at all? Mm. Uh, Feel free to jump around. Any other oh, the quick changes you like or anything? Go ahead. Do the quick changes. Uh, <laughs> changes. I remember, it was like so we were we had this scene like a lot of us. I know it was like me and Emily, and I don't know if I don't know if Maddie you were on there too. I don't think so. But we had this scene where we were like townspeople when like they were advertising the peach and all these people would come up and they took pictures and stuff. So we were all up and we had like these like little cameras and we had everything and um. And we were all kind of just like, we had this like one little scene and then we had to go off. But then right after that, we had the bug scene. So it was like that scene and where we're one character and then another character. So we had to like run off stage. We literally had to run in heels. I was wearing like tiny heels. And so we risked like breaking our ankles the entire time. We had to run around, like run around all backstage and then outside through the alley back change and then come back on for our next scene. But like our mics would get caught, our dresses would get caught on things. It was dark back there, so we couldn't see. It was just, it was crazy. So we had to like help each other and it was like so chaotic. And like, <laughs> we were like on the verge of tears the entire time. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It was quick changes and things like that. It's hard. Yeah. Go ahead, Maddie. My, so I didn't really have any quick changes, um, but the change from sponge to the sailor took the entirety of intermission plus the beginning of the show because I had so much blue eyeshadow on and that it came to the point where I couldn't get it off so I just had to wear it for act two but I couldn't look like sponge because you know the kids would have been like oh my god it's sponge um but that became a quick change but it was like a 15 minute long quick change <laughs> yeah I like that last moment of um that everyone's on stage and yeah, and you know it's Sponge and Spiker mm -hmm. and cares and uh, and, and he, even Ian comes out as the mayor of New York. Which is funny. You can live in Central Park. You can live in Central Park. <laughs> and, uh, but that's cute. I like seeing the whole cast at the end with the city skyline and the peach on the on the mm -hmm. building. It's really cute, you know. And they say the title of the show and they wave. I've done that a lot, where people wave at the end, and mm -hmm. that'll be a response. I always find streamers, because you have to throw up the streamers, and like, I'd always oh, find yeah. like, in my hair, or like in my <laughs> dress, or like in my hat. It was always different every night, but it was fun. Anything else, anybody? Anything at all? It can be a blooper, you can talk about a production element. Go ahead, Emily. Oh, unmute yourself, dear. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um. I was remembering throughout the rehearsal process that uh, a lot of it was actually just rehearsing with the music because we had to time it perfectly. 
And I just remember how frustrating it was because we would just go back and redo it. And Ani, poor Ani, had to do it so many times because he had those big monologues about the beach. And it was just, it was, it was a time just sitting there and like getting those and getting those. And it's, it was hard, but it obviously paid off um, in the show and it looks really good, but. Oh, it looked great. Yeah, it was, it was a hard time getting all of that. Yeah, well, it's tough because uh, it's not. I mean, it's funny how if something is in kind of a poetry form, it, it'll work with most music, sort of, or you can you just kind of have to make it work. Um, and it did, but it just took time to, to figure out what that timing is and how to say it with the music, because obviously they didn't um, they didn't come as a pair, but um, they end up blending quite nicely, I think, uh, on the recording. I remember that one song, like the actual, like the only like chant song in the show where you had the weirdest lines. Like it, like it was like so hard to memorize because we just had this music and we all had our own like little monologues. And I remember we all had to time it perfectly. And it was like, the lyrics were so strange. Like I said something like, what did I say? What was my line? Like a new and Nosferus. Like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's we're all dolls. Weird yeah. Nonsense. So. so that was hard, but. I remember um, uh, in rehearsals when you said, all right, you've got to go over and whack the earthworm. So the first time I went over and I nearly <laughs> took it off the stick. <laughs> just let me well say that's a, a, a Muhammad Ali knockout for sure. Yeah, I told you, just give him a little slap and you're like. Tap will do it. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I got two settings: uh, a drill, hammer, and butterfly. I can never get in between the two. <laughs> How'd you like using that earthworm puppet there, Giuseppe? Okay, so watching, so initially, uh, it was like kind of weird for me because I've never done anything like that. But oh. eventually, I was just like. I just kept watching the earthworm really. I tried to like focus everything into that. Um, and like wherever he looked, I looked, um, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. I tried to keep him moving, keep it alive. So it wasn't like dead. Um, but I'm glad that it was like smaller and like very light because I remember what Cassie went through with uh, <laughs> the snake in the jungle book. So it, it was cool. It was a cool experience. Yeah, this one was a lot, a lot lighter. But yeah. so comfortable. It was just air duct. Yeah, and like the only thing that happened like a few times was like it just kept like you remember like the head like came, like it didn't come off but like the inside it, like split a little bit. Yeah, it's air duct, and then at either end it was just a a foam like triangle, and then we covered it with a uh, with fabric. And then the glasses are um, I don't know like pipe cleaners for the the part that goes around the ear, and then. The, the glasses themselves were the caps to like a like a thing of tennis balls or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Painted black. I mean, just whatever. And I remember getting this. I I was in Walmart for something else, props or whatever. And I remember uh, I just happened to see that fabric of the worm. I was like, oh, that looks like a worm. That's perfect. <laughs> you know, it was like eleven at night. You know. I was like, and there was no one there to cut the fabric for me, and I just kept pressing that, you know, assistance needed. And I was like, oh, <laughs> God, you're, you know, trying to get <laughs> skin for the earthworm. <laughs> Kill me, you know? That's, that's the job. That's fun. Yeah. Any, anybody else on anything at all? Yeah, John. I want to mention something about the earthworm, too. I just thought that poor thing got abused so much. <laughs> between getting smacked and then that whole scene where I'm like using him as bait for the seagulls oh, yeah. <laughs> there would be some nights where I'd like I tried to set him like I, you know, I, like I would like throw him out but I'd always try to set him down so like he never got so nothing actually happened to it there was one night where like I put it down and I didn't catch it or I didn't put it down soft enough and I remember I saw the head cut up a little bit <laughs> and I make that gap I'm like uh oh but, but that thing that was fun that was a that was a fun puppet and it's it's definitely because we had this giant snake in the jungle book it was it was cool because it was like you know i remember seeing the giant snake but it i can only imagine it was you know the comparison even in size because 
when Giuseppe would run across, he would have both ends kind of, because there's a stick for both ends, so he'd already, he'd have it tucked into himself, he'd run by. When Cassie ran by with that snake, she took up the entire hallway. Yeah, it was even longer. Uh, but I thought, I just thought it was really cool, because I always thought the snake puppet was cool, so seeing the worm use the same, you know, style for puppetry was really, was really neat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I got an email from some woman after the show who was like a speech therapist or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She wanted the earthworm, and I was like, "Oh my god!" Well, it's it so pretty. I mean, there's like safety pins holding it together, and uh, you know, I don't know. She never picked it up. So. <laughs> Anybody else done anything at all? Anything at all? Yeah, Maddie. I don't, this is like kind of for everyone, because I know for me, like, w not even this show, just watching all the other shows back, kind of chronologically. I know we got a little out of order, but it's been nice to see like my acting progress like definitely and, and still even watching these things back now um there's things i would do i don't know differently so much but better in a way i'm seeing like in james like things with sponge that i could have done to make her even bigger of a character and i think it's just cool to watch back and be like oh you know i could have changed that and see how i'm able to like you know critique myself which is really fun. Yeah, absolutely, Maddie. Um, bigger, oh my gosh. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I liked, I enjoyed, uh, I didn't know who to use for, um, for Aunt Sponge. You called uh, me and you asked me. Did I? I remember. I you remember. Called me. Yeah, because I remember I got the phone call for the first time because I was new, so I was like, I don't know how this works. And so my mom picked up the phone and you asked to speak to me, and I was like, Oh my god, what's gonna happen? And you were like, So you offered me two roles. You were like, So I have two roles, and you were like, You could either be Ladybird, who's kind of like sweet and nice and like proper, and she was like, Or you could be Aunt Sponge, who's like mean and grouchy and like just like obnoxious and ridiculous. And I was like who would you rather me play? I was like, what What do you think? And so you suggested that I play Lady Bird. You were like, I think that'll like fit you better. So that's what, that's like why I chose that character. Cause like, that's what you preferred for me. But I remember you like gave me the option or something. Yeah, so there you go. So I couldn't, I couldn't decide, but I was happy to, you know, with Aunt Spiker, as, as soon as I met Mimi and just her, her, you know, how she acted and I was like, that was obvious. Um, but on Sponge, I didn't know, but it was fun to give it to you, Maddie, because it's like, I don't know, it was just something super different and it was Yeah, wild. definitely out of my comfort zone, but it was one of my favorite roles ever. Great, yeah. It I was really fun. It'd be good for you to do something totally not, you know, I don't know, just un, un mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the right word is, but just uh, out of the norm, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? I yeah, think... Josh, and then, well, go ahead, Ben, and then Josh. Oh, I was going to say, just for me, uh, about Maddie's question about um, improving, I, I found that um, when I first came to Majestic, I had taken a few acting classes, and during the school year, I also picked up um, technique about uh, uh, Sandy Meisner and a couple of others at college. But what I found that Majestic gave me is it just let me relax uh, taught me how to relax on stage and be comfortable because I found at the end of this one, I just started relaxing in the last day. I thought, oh, good, I, I've just gotten the hang of it. And, and, it was, and, it, and that was sort of the progression for me was just relaxing on stage and being comfortable and just uh, playing off all the elements in the play. Uh, that's good. That's good to hear. Uh, as I like to mention every... Uh time we do this that we have one week of rehearsal um yeah. so it's good to hear that you guys like you know had fun or you were able to relax on stage when um i know it can feel kind of crazy uh at times so that's always uh very nice to hear and i enjoy maddie too about it's so awesome when i first kind of get these from wh whoever videotapes it and i watch it generally like five months later and it's so nice to just sit back and relax and just take it in for what it is and, en and enjoy it and having mm -hmm. that having that gap of time and just coming into it fresh and just enjoying it as an audience member, um, I, I find very helpful. And yeah, and I look and I say, oh, did I need to do that or whatever? Yeah, so I learned from it too. Um, but I really enjoy um, 
uh, approaching it after some time has passed. And because um, I and I, you know, maybe I don't say this often enough, but I, I know that like I try to say, hey, listen, guys, there's a lot of good here. There's a lot of good stuff. But again, given the time crunch, mm-hmm. and just my role, it's just I have to tell you what isn't working. Um, I can't spend all day complimenting uh, what is. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Maddie, uh, and I think Autumn and Josh. Yeah, I'll have something so we can go in that go in that order. Go ahead, Maddie. Um, two things. One thing is, you know, you said Sponge is something really out of my comfort zone. And she was. I'd never done something that over the top or even a, a villain at that point. Um, and I think just the atmosphere of Majestic really allowed me to explore how outlandish I could be because I wasn't really embarrassed of being too over the top because if I went too far, like the first time I banged the pan, <laughs> I was a little too loud. I think I scared you. And you were like, no, Maddie, you need to calm that down. Um, but then also on the note giving part, I always told myself, okay, I was like, okay, if Steve doesn't have anything at all to say, that means I'm doing good. Like with you, I was always like, no news is good news from Steve. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I like when, you, when you're banging the pot with the spoon looking for James, whatever, yeah. I remember at one point, <laughs> you used to just go clank, 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 Yeah, because the first time I didn't, I, I didn't tell anyone I was doing it. I, I was just like, eh, I'm going to try this. So no one was expecting it. And I think Aurora jumped like 10 feet in the air. And then I remember, I remember you adding something in at first. I was like, oh, geez, that's a little bit too much. But then I ended, yeah. then I ended up liking it. <laughs> And it was, you didn't just bang the pot, you slowly <laughs> went and, then I went and banged it, you know? I thought that was funny. Yeah, well, Autumn and then Josh. Um, no, I was just going to talk about the lighting, um, <clears throat> because you used a lot of, like, lighting work. And, like, I remember um, there was this scene where the aunts were, like, getting chased by the peach and they were dying. And so you used, like, the flashing lights, and it looked really cool, like, because I, I was backstage, so I didn't get to see it. So I really liked how, like, you did that with, like, the lights and the adaptation of it, because it just made it seem like <clears throat> they were actually, like, running away from it. And then it would, like, go black and then come back up. And just the way it was done, it just made it look, like, realistic. And it was really cool the way... It, like with simple lights too like you didn't do anything crazy but it, it just worked it did really well and oh. then like, there's the scene with like like i remember after giuseppe's monologue and then it goes like there's the thunder and then it goes black and then he like disappears and then the lights go back up and he's gone and it like looks really cool because it's like a split second but it just it really works it, it was really cool to watch it yeah go ahead giuseppe you got something you, but something. i watched when i watched it back i because i always wondered what it looked like because i felt like uh, I don't know. I felt like people could still see me, but then watching it, I was like, "Oh, okay, that looks pretty, pretty cool." Yeah, like, you, disappear. you disappear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of lights, I love uh, you know, of the age we live in, internet and all that, and LEDs. So. All those green wow. little. Yeah. yeah those, that was so LEDs. cool because they lit up even when it was black, and you could just see the lights, and it was just this little bag that he was carrying around, and that was all you could see, and yeah. it was so cool. Yeah, very effective, and um. And, and and props to Ani too for when he trips, he has to tap the light inside to shut it off. Um, so it makes it look like they, they fell out of the bag. He does that kind of behind the tree and he pulls that off really well. Yeah. And it's not easy because you could say, oh, I know how to make the bag light up, throw some LEDs in there. How do you turn them off? You know, yeah. you have to figure stuff like that out. You yeah. know? Um, and thanks to him for saying that it looks like yeah, I thought it was really. What cool. are you gonna do with with the peach rolls and and squashes? Yeah. What else are you gonna do? I, you know, <laughs> those strobe light yeah, and then yeah. I'm just running in front of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. so, and I like. Um, fortunately, on the recording, his head is kind of cut off. It wasn't like that live, but um, I like the light shining up at Ani for his last big monologue and act one. Um, his shadow on the peach as he's telling the, the peach narration. Oh, there's like the silhouette at the yeah. beginning of act two after it was like the scene where the music transition from transitioned from kind of like the scary like spooky music to like when we finally realized we were on the peach and we were in the water but then we just had it was like one of the promo shots too where it was just our silhouettes of the bugs all in our default positions yeah. and the way it was set up and the way you like staged that and blocked it it just looked so cool with all of our like our positions and just like in a line i just really like the way that looked yeah i like that too and it goes with the music really well yeah yeah, yeah and um Oh, I remember I wanted, I wanted um, to use like a trap door in the, yeah, there's Ani. 
I wanted I wanted there to be like a trap door on the stage and you guys would actually come out from underneath the stage. But beneath the majestic stage is uh, is tricky business. It's really tricky mm -hmm. business. And uh that was one of the things we did it once like at our production meeting for, <laughs> for Danny and the carpenters was like, uh no, you gotta figure out something else. It was like because at the at that like first scene we all had to go down the stairs, but it was pitch black and we, we weren't given any lights. You the, no one was like okay you can have a little bit of light so you can see. No, we were all we were like <laughs> me, we were wearing high heels and we were like we just have to like just be really careful. But we had to run too because we had to be quick. So it was like just crossing our fingers that I wouldn't trip and fall again. <laughs> like just so I compromised by just having you guys beneath beneath the, the, the front of the stage and kind of yeah. come up through the center as if you're coming. Yeah. yeah. Looked fine. So a good example of, I'm glad they said no to me, you know, that's, yeah. just, that's totally unnecessary to have a trap. You know, that worked just fine. Yeah. Uh, a little, little kid, he, uh, one kid who I was, you know, someone who, I, it's a kid who I knew because um, he lives in my town. I, he was right in the front row when we did that. We were hiding underneath. He saw me and went, oh, and just handed me some popcorn <laughs> right before. I, just, I, took, I mean, I took it. You know, it's a little piece, so, but, so that, was, I, that was funny. That was fun. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything? Anything at all? Anything at all? I'm, I'm... Oh, I do want to mention, like, I yeah. think we were talking about, oh, Maddie, what was your, what did you say about characters? Or, like, what did you, oh, were you oh. talking about, like, seeing yourself acting and, like, I, I remember, Seeing all these videos back, it I it, it was nice to to watch myself grow, um, because uh, you know when you watch yourself a little bit when you're a bit younger and whatnot and you're still figuring out exactly what you, you know, what to do when you're acting like uh like Jungle Book was a good example because you know it was it was a fun one and I don't think I did like you know watching myself back you know I'm like I could definitely do this different I could have you know I was I was kind of staring off into space there and then and watching this one because this one's you know a little bit more recent I'm able to be like okay. I'm, Fixed there. I'm, I know I'm, you know, I'm planted here. I know what I'm doing here. You know, I'm staring off this face again over there, but that's fine. So it's just cool to watch yourself. It's cool to watch that growth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was just thinking, guys, I jotted down a couple things, but um, it's such a strange little story. Uh, what's the moral? What's the point of it? What's the point of James and the Giant Peach? I mean, what's it about? If you had to sum up the moral or the message, what on earth is it anyway? I mean, after all the weirdness, what is it? Go ahead, Emily. I just always think of it as like making the best out of the worst situation because everything just bad happens to James and the bugs and he himself especially just makes the best out of it, especially with the seagulls, with the sharks, you know. He knows exactly what to do and he knows how to make it better for everyone. And I think that's an important message. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, I, go ahead, uh, Maddie and then Ben, go ahead. Um, I totally agree with Emily. And then also on top of that, for me, it was kind of finding like your family anywhere else because none of the bugs are the same. And obviously James is a, human person so they all come from different backgrounds and different walks of life but they're they all find family within each other and I thought that was a really nice message yeah yeah absolutely and I mean and it's kind of like why bugs anyway I mean mm -hmm. and I think part of that is probably we're all just saying well you can make them animals like mammals or whatever but that's kind of boring no one's done bugs before so mm -hmm. I think some of that probably but and when we first meet the the insects and to a certain degree this is in the book and it's in the and it's also in the in our script that in i mean giant insects would be really scary uh mm -hmm. you know but he and he's afraid at first but then he he accepts them and he talks to them and he becomes like their leader uh like you said emily uh, because he's just uh he, he has ingenuity and he you know he uses his mind and he's he's bright and uh and you're right he talking about making the best out of a a crummy situation he has a, he has a real positive sense of life and he he always looks on the positive side and um you know using his imagination and things like that you know he has a, a, a good perspective a bright perspective you know kind of like sarah crew and, and mowgli and others you know yeah ben what you're gonna what you're gonna have well, what what am i reason uh, well i think raul Dahl sort of just writes fairy tale stories like 
Grimm or Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale style. But what I really like, or the in the vein of the feeling, he does, he obviously writes prose and all that. Yeah. But what I really like about it is he doesn't have a direct moral like Hans Christian Andersen. He clearly took from his childhood and he took from his imagination and the love of the English countryside and he just blended it all together. So the children are played up to that way instead of played down where you shove the moral in your face so they can take what they want out of it and because it's Raul Dahl and uh, it's going to be something good because he took from friendship and hatred of authority and, and making someone really nasty to look out for and always blended all those good things together in a not an obvious way yeah sometimes the best stor storytelling is you, that you get you receive the message implicitly but you don't even quite realize it you know you just take you take in all those the concretes being thrown at you um and you, you just know what the message is implicitly and it's not uh, it's not overly didactic it's not uh, drumming you over the head with with it um but yeah classic kind of fairy tale stuff going on the loss of the parents to being sent away to live with people who treat you and then overcoming uh overcoming them and defeating them and then making friends when you don't you know you don't expect to make friends but just by having a positive attitude and and i think at the end he says something like james says something like uh well, what, you, what can you say? Uh, I was once the loneliest boy, and now I have more friends than I could imagine. Because he's famous, because he's, you know, the peach dropped in New York City, and now now everybody knows and loves him. You know, it's not just even the bugs. It's like he's worldwide famous. You know, but, but yeah, it's a nice it's a nice message. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I see we're about at the hour mark. I don't know if there anyone has any uh, any final thoughts or anything that you didn't get to say or get in or any uh, last questions or anything like that, now's the time. I think we covered it all then. Carly, are you there? Is there anything from the crowd? Yeah. Uh, no other audience questions. I, I think we pretty much touched on everything today. This was awesome. Thanks to you guys for being here. Thank you all so much, guys. This was fun. Yeah, this is fun as always. As for what's next, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe you're a good man, Charlie Brown. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Maybe, maybe let's do that next. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going cool. on a whim. All right. yeah. Well, until next time. Thanks, you guys. Have Thanks. a good night. Bye. 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 Bye.